Hello, Rim to the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon are growing all around the world. This is episode number 353. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hello, good friends out there. It's raining a lot in the Ozarks, and it's been kind of rough to take. You know how it is if you don't have a lot of sunshine. But I think that it's for a purpose. I think that we're going to have lots and lots of food grown here. You know, as we drive down the roads, you can see people are putting out big gardens. And I think that everybody, uh, whether they're tuned into the news that we listen to, know that, that the inflation is causing big problems. And there's a there's a commercial on guys that I just love. It was it's this guy pulling a cart with his little boy, and they're taking uh, vegetables to all their um, neighbors. And it says that he, if when he grew up, he finally realized his dad didn't uh, grow extra, and he had to give it away. He grew extra so he could give it away. And I thought, boy, that's a a lesson for all of us, you know, thinking about your neighbors. And and uh, I I have looked at things across the board with the inflation, guys. And just in our uh, natural gas bill doubled over at the office, didn't it, hon? It did. uh, I think in some aspects it, of course, we didn't really know what to expect at Diggins. Uh But uh, it almost like it tripled on us. Well, and but that was before they got ceilings ceilings in and everything everything, like that. But, I mean, it was was really unbelievable. And I know the electric bills, I've, I've heard them talk on the news in Springfield's went up and then, uh, the groceries and oh my goodness! Well, gas here yesterday hit four oh four a gallon. Yeah, I remember when it was four something a gallon here several years ago, and boy, it just made you swallow hard when you filled up your vehicle because <laughs> it, you know, it's, it takes such a large amount of money to do that. But we're going to be all right, guys. Those that put their faith in God are going to be okay. You know, God, we we have to endure this shaking. We have to endure it. And he's exposing things, and then we're going to see God's judgment on this wickedness. Yeah, we are. And uh, that, that one of the things that we pray over our partners every day is that God would supernaturally protect them. Yes. And that God would supernaturally provide for them. Mm-hmm. And so we're expecting to hear miracles and multiplication and, and many different things in, in the lives of our partners. I, I think that's going to be one of the things that's going to be distinctive of, of the remnant you know, Jesus said that the labor was worthy of his hire. Mm-hmm. And as we're out laboring in the field, the Father's going to take care of us. He will. He absolutely will. And, I mean, he's he's providing everything we need. We're going forward over at the conference center. Uh, it's looking so good. I can't wait till they get completely done and we can do a little video for you, walk through there. Yeah, I can't wait to show you the, uh, the uh, fellowship hall because you, you saw how rough it looked. They've got it painted. They're putting in the uh, the drop ceiling and everything. It looks like a different building. It really does. And uh, I've been working on on menus. I've been checking prices and and getting an estimate of of uh, how much we're going to need. And it's just really exciting. I've been looking at recipes like crazy. <laughs> going to get the best food I can. Um, I just think there's blessings in food. I think that that's why. Um, those that follow Satan curse food is because they know that, that it could be blessed. And I, I even think there's not only did God create food to heal our bodies, but I think that there's there's healing there for sickness when you pray over the food. And so I'm I'm just excited about everything that's that's going on. In the news, we've got a lot of talk about the monkeypox. And I remember hearing all the, the people on the stations we listen to you know, saying this is the next thing, this is the next thing they're going to do, you know, to try to push a vaccine. And I, I looked up some um, some of the news art- articles, and there's several of them. Even the New York Post says U.S. buys millions of monkeypox vaccines after Massachusetts confirms a case. So I did a little, uh, I was trying to listen to some some of the doctors on what they're saying. Uh, years ago, there in 2003, there was... Uh, a U.S. outbreak of this, and it came from um, prairie dogs were sold as pets before they developed signs of the infections, how it got out. 
because uh, most of this stuff comes from, um, the shipment came from Ghana, imported to Texas in April of 2003. And so I was looking to see, like, the severity of it. Um, I think it's somewhere, with all the different things I read, between chickenpox and smallpox. Smallpox was a very serious one. Uh, but I did listen to one of the doctors I trust that said that uh, the treatment for it is very well tolerated. And um, so it's, I think it's, it's another thing they're going to try to use the fear factor. I think they're going to try to to push the masks again and shutdowns because it's all part mm-hmm. of the elite plan. Yeah, although the masks don't work for monkeypox because it's not airborne, it's... Well, it's it's through. Um, I think it takes. It's not easily. No, it's it's, it's, it's hard through to get. bodily uh, fluids. fluids, and so like if somebody sneezed on you or something, yeah. I'm sure. But I think that um, I think they're going to try to push it, you know, just like they're pushing everything else. My hope is that we we just keep praying over the elections and that God's mercy will will allow our nation to get some people that actually have um, common sense. In, the, <laughs> in our politics. Well, it's interesting as you look at there was, uh, you know, Devos and the World Economic Forum and all that were involved right before the uh, COVID outbreak on a scenario if there was a world outbreak of a novel COVID. And then within months, we had an outbreak of a novel COVID. Well, this year they did one on monkeypox. And then here this comes. It's like it's this think tank that is trying to you know how is how best can we take over the world and and destroy nation borders and well i think the biggest problem is that the covid situation through the vaccines and all of it um unless somebody just got covid and recovered from it where they have the antibodies i think that there's going to be um the immune systems have been compromised yeah and i think then that makes any serious infection any viral infection worse worse yeah i do too and so we just need to keep praying i believe that god is going to meet what the enemy's doing with a great power outflow and i think that that it we're going to see miraculous healings and i think we're going to see people that that may be having uh, the impact of the vaccines be totally restored i do too that's one of the things that uh you know we as the remnant remnant we're uh we're kind of like God's special forces. I've always I've always shared that. And one of the things that we need to do is to uh, pray the price, to be in a position to where the healing of God can flow through us mm-hmm. to the rest of the body, so that uh, whatever the enemy has done, that it can be restored. God, I I think we're coming to this this moment of of coming out of Egypt. And receiving all the Passover lamb where the book of Psalms says that when they came out of Egypt, no matter, you know, the, and they went through some harsh conditions, they were underfed, all these different things, that there was not one feeble one among them. I, I think there is going to be a time of supernatural restoration, spirit, soul, and body mm-hmm. for those that have ears to hear and that will really begin seeking the kingdom of God. And Mary, I'm excited to see that. I am too. I, I've been looking for it for years. Um, because it was part of the what God showed me many years ago. Not only did I see judgment coming, but I saw the possibilities of, if people pray, how things could be turned around. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's one of those times I think that God's working on us in a whole bunch of different areas. I think he's, he's working on us to uh, look at our physical health and get some of those things straightened out. I think he's looking on it at... Anything that um, is in the past or things that that have hindered us um, may be coming to the surface. I mean, people, you know, it's a rough time anyway just because of all the, you know, the what they've done to the economy and, and the forecast of what they say is coming. But, you know, if you have things coming up from the past or things like that, it's kind of hard to deal with anyway, but a lot of times this will even open the door. If if you're in, uh, like a lot of people are panicking right now, and so if you get in a panic state, then a lot of things will just bubble up. And so I think it's it's a time when um, there there will be things coming up 
if there's anything there, I think it's going to bubble yeah. to the surface. And I know we've experienced that in in the last couple of years. Um, we've had to look at so many things. You know, when we when we first started on this journey, I'd just been, let's see, came out in January. My depression broke in January of 2000 or 1994. And then it was the fall of 2005, the witch crawled in the van and all the occult people came after us. So I had a little bit of time there to kind of get some strength built. But boy, I'll tell you, the ensuing years <laughs> were right. something to, to behold. Um, and I, I'm thankful every day that God gave me that year and a half of strength building and learning the word and, and um, getting strong before that hit. I mean, I, I've looked back so many times and thought, what would I have done if that had happened? And I was in that depressed state, that just downtrodden state. Of course, maybe, you know, that part of the reason they did come after us is because because I wasn't in it anymore. Uh, but I've thought, if you are depressed or there's something going on anyway, could you imagine the pressure? And that's what I feel like so many people are struggling with, you know, even if they don't know God or if they do know God, is these these are um, really trying times. And I think if someone didn't have their trust in God, it it, it would so easily um, cause fear. Yeah, easy. And, we, you know, we need to get to the place, guys, where we're not moved by fear, we're moved by faith, because the enemy uses fear. That, that is the, the chief thing right now that they're mm-hmm. using, is fear to control the population. It fear, is. Fear of whether it's a food shortage, fear of whatever pox are running around or whatever yeah. flu is running around. They, they constantly use fear to manipulate because, guys, when, when you, when you, I remember when I was going through psych class that if you put enough fear on people, the rational part of the brain will shut down. And people are, are easily, people that normally uh, would not just look for a leader to, to fix everything or, or whatever – would not do that. They're highly independent. When you, if you put enough fear on them, all of that shuts down, and they will run off a cliff if the whole herd runs off a cliff. Yeah, we've and, seen that. And so, if if we we we've got to be the voice, and in the middle of all this den of the enemy, moving in faith. Yeah, that's right. And, and giving be, people hope. Giving people hope and declaring the word of God mm-hmm. and what God is speaking at that moment. There, there are 365 fear knots in the King James Bible that God, 360, one a day, he said, fear not, fear not, fear not. And guys, this is not a time for fear. This is a time to say, God, begin examining my heart. Root out the fear. Help me replace it with faith. Because when, and some of the things we're going to talk about today in, in crisis, and, and I, I've, you know, I've heard about this before that um, people that have really developed their faith and have really developed spiritually, when they get into a crisis and their mind kicks off, that's when their spirit kicks in. And that's when supernatural faith begins to mm-hmm. take hold. And guys, that's where we need to get. That's yeah. that's where that's where the Holy Spirit is wanting to take us right now. Well, I, I think that ahead of us are so many opportunities to show the miracle working power of God because there are going to be more needs. You know that I've I've already heard uh, that uh, crime is is escalating everywhere. Uh, you know there are always people that are going to commit crimes. We saw that when they had out in California. They said that they could steal so much and wouldn't be prosecuted, and how they just would rampage and things. That's in that's in a place where you have food everywhere. Imagine if there are food shortages. What those type yeah. of people would do. And we need to understand that what the progressives are doing, and a lot of them are George Soros-backed uh, district attorneys, that they're they're not prosecuting crime the way that they used to, which actually is promoting crime because they want to cause the social unrest. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, guys, and, and what 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 does all that do? It creates fear, and we we need to meet that with kingdom. And to do that, our, our hearts have got to be free. There has to be a flow between our spirits and our souls for us to function the way that we need to function. Yeah. I think one of the greatest problems that Christians experience is like we've talked about before, when that 
you know, we say the heart is the, the central part of the person. It's the connection point between your spirit and your soul. spirit man and your soul. And um, if you get if you get that clogged, you know, but that flow between your saved spirit, then you don't go through a normal sanctification process. Part of it's blocked. And you'll struggle and you'll, um, you know, in, in a, um, a perfect example would be like if a person got saved, there was nothing blocking their heart, that the Holy Spirit would flow through your saved spirit, through your heart, and then the renewal process would just go. Yeah. Over your mind, your will, your emotions, it would be it would start coming in line, and you could easily move in the, in the in the kingdom and the power of God. Right, but there's not very many people I think that experience that. I think most people start out with generational curses, all kinds of things Wounds that are there. And many oh, different yeah, things. and you can mm-hmm. almost imagine it. You know, have you ever seen with a fire truck that has those big fire hoses? Mm-hmm. What would happen if you would dial that back down? Okay, you go from that. To one of those little straws like the kids get at school when they when they get their little juices. Mm-hmm. That's what happens when you have a hardened heart and you have a wounded heart. It, it takes that flow that needs to be the size of a fire hose and it brings it down to this little yeah. bitty trickle. Well, the heart is key to salvation. Romans 10, 9 says uh, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So that's key. And then we know from uh, Mark 7 where Jesus said, uh, um, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, uh, pride, foolishness. Um, So without God and an unsaved spirit, that's just what's going to naturally flow through fallen man. And let me let me comment too on on uh, Mark or yeah, it, was, it was Mark seven. Uh-huh. A lot of people try to use that saying that Jesus did away with the dietary laws because of a statement there. He didn't. What he was doing, he was raising the standard because he said, "Listen, okay, you don't eat pork, you don't eat shrimp, and you're so careful with that, but you have ignored your heart. Mm-hmm. And look at what's coming out of your heart. Everywhere that Jesus, uh, when you read the Gospels and you understand Torah properly, in every aspect." Jesus never lowered the standard. He raised it because of the new birth that he was going to bring. And we, we, we have always got to be conscious of that. And if we, we claim to be born again and these things are coming out of us, we have a contaminated, broken heart that God needs to heal. Yeah, there's, there's lots of conditions that, um, you know, you can have a proud heart. It says in Proverbs 21, 4, a high look and a proud heart. And the plowing of the wicked is sin. And so there's lots of conditions of the heart. Um, You can have a broken heart, and and any of those wounds will stop that flow we were talking about. You can have a divided heart. Um, And that's something that um, people that have went through trauma Mm -hmm. will have because their soul gets divided, and um, you, you may have a a part of your soul that when it's in the consciousness, then it flows flows okay. But then you have other places that are walled off. And when those those are in the consciousness, I remember, you know, as I was getting healed, I, I would think, man, I made a lot of progress, and I'm, I'm, I can uh, quote the word, and I feel faith rise up. And then I might get up another day, and it was just like I lost all my progress. And it, it wasn't, because if you... If I waited till I, I learned I, it was cyclical, um, and it would cycle around, and then I'd be back. And then I learned I, I just started making charts, and I identified, you know, what, what parts of me were there, and there were the um, parts that were arrested in development, you know, that through my life I'd cry like a little kid sometimes and be so embarrassed. And, and I learned to, uh, based on what was there, how to identify. And then I just started pleading the blood of Jesus, speak in the name of Jesus, declaring the word, and I just started getting healed. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you didn't even know how that worked, if you didn't know it was there, you wouldn't have a clue what to what to pray because no. God just took me step by step through it. And um, I think that one of the the things that, that you had to come to grips with um, was 
your heart had been shut down. And yeah. you could talk about that and I'll... You know, when you listen to my testimony, you know, when I was born, I wasn't supposed to live. My mom, you know, did dedicate me to God and I survived. Uh, when I was born, I was, I was two and a half, almost three months premature, if I'm remembering right. And uh, they didn't expect me to live through the night. You could hold me in one hand, you know, <laughs> and uh, I was that small. But she never really did anything to facilitate that dedication. And uh, then she began dating a man from church named Bob Blake. And uh, he made my life a living hell. And I kind of got thrown under the bus over that. And uh, there, was, there was a lot of emotional, verbal abuse. Uh, I remember a lot of nights that he would get home about two hours before my mom did from work, and he would find something to begin lecturing and yelling at me about uh, for hours. And he would quit about 15 minutes before she got home so I could get settled down to where she didn't know what was going on. Uh, and there were a lot of times she did know what was going on. It did absolutely nothing about it. Uh, like if I had done something wrong, one of his favorite punishments is he would have me hold a butter knife out for an hour. And any time that I would lower, lower my arm, he would hit me with a belt. And all these different things really shut down my heart. And uh, I was telling you the other day that one of his, whenever he would go into a rant, one of his favorite sayings was, you know, every dog has his day, every dog has his day. And I remember as a kid thinking, well, if this dog ever has his day, you'll drop dead. And, and this uh, started, uh, he moved in your house before they got married. Yeah, before so they got married. It was how old were you? Um, eight, maybe. And even then, uh, he was telling me he couldn't wait till I got out of his house, even before they were married. And, uh, you know, young kids usually will have a, uh, hard time, like going to, to see Ken folk and being away from the house more than two or three days. I would go for a month or more. I, I, I think back and I almost want to apologize to my Ken folk down in Ireton because I'd stay a couple of weeks of this one, a couple of weeks of that one anything to stay away from the house and none of them really knew what was going on uh even uh even later on in life uh for some reason my mom runs on pity and, and she would here we are running her around to doctors and everything else and she would throw us under the bus just for pity and stuff and you know you, you just you look back at that and uh i i, w I was shut down i mean i I could I could watch a rom com and never cry. I mean, I, I very seldom would I ever cry, and uh, because that was all shut off. And I, I look back and I grimace at the times when our girls were little that I should have been able to love them and, and be a better dad, and I couldn't because my heart was shut down. And that's probably one of the uh, greatest griefs of my life. It really is. And uh, you know, God's been working on me and. Uh, my grandsons are a joy to me, like unbelievable. And it's like I'm I'm making up for lost time with them. Uh, but in this whole thing, it, it is, you know, there seems to be a process to where, um, I don't know if it's after you turn 60, all of a sudden you start getting bombarded with every stupid thing you ever did in your life. And I got a long list of them. I know all of us do. And you just thank you, you know, it's, it's I remember one time that, uh, you know, back when, when I was a kid, your mama was a was kind of like a rhetorical phrase that you would use. Mm -hmm. And I had a neighbor that had lost his mom a year before, and we got an argument, and I said, your mama, and he ran off crying. That has bothered me ever since. And, you know, things like that would come up. And God says, listen, just plead the blood of Jesus into it. You've already asked me to forgive you. Now forgive yourself. Yeah, that's a hard part is forgiving and, uh, ourselves. And, for, and forgiving <laughs> ourselves. And, and I would go through the cycles of this. And um, once God began healing the heart, um, I'll cry over anything. All I got to do is think about, oh, yeller, and I'll start crying or something. <laughs> you know, it's just, and uh, I was asking God about that yesterday. You know, it's like, I remember when um, the boys were out there track meet. And they had never really done track before, and they did really well. And I saw them interacting with kids. I had tears streaming down my face because I was so proud of them, and I was so happy for them. And God said that whenever you have your heart hardened like that, all the tears that you should have shed are still there. And once you begin getting healed, 
that, that, that they're going to be released. Yeah. Well, I think you, don't you think that you were shown as an example that kids weren't important? Oh, no. Well, not, because not, you, you mentioned to me where they would go to work and you didn't, you'd be at home in the summers and didn't have any food. No. But they would leave food for you to start supper even when you were young. Yeah. And, and so I, I had to scrounge for food a lot of times. And uh, there was a reason why when I joined the Army, besides that time I was sick, that I weighed 128 pounds. When, um, when I went in the Army, okay, they're marching you all over the place. The only time they would ever, they, they would call them cattle cars. They'd pack us in whenever we had to. That was only if the heat index got over like 100 and something, okay? So we're marching, we're running. And, but I got three square meals a day. I gained, everybody else was losing weight. I gained weight during basic training. I put on 25, 30 pounds during basic training because I was actually being able to eat three square meals a day. And uh, I think that's been part of um, your struggle with food. Because when we first got married, you were slim and you could eat anything. You never gained, gained any weight. Um, but I think once you, you got to where you could have food, um, you just wanted to make up for things that you didn't have. Yeah, and I, and I've even dealt with the same thing with the TV because when when I was a was kid, um, he just got in his head. I think he just wanted me out of the living room. He didn't want me in there. That on school nights from Sunday night at seven o'clock until Friday night, I was not allowed to be in the living room. I had to sit in my room whether I had homework or not. And so what I did is I rebelled and didn't do my homework. It wasn't until I actually got into college that I went back up to straight A's. It wasn't that I couldn't do the work. I just refused to do the work because of the way I was treated. And, uh, guys, you know, all, the, all that stuff takes a toll. But the good news is that God can heal. God can restore. And I, I remember when all this stuff first began happening, I'm thinking, okay, I'm crying at, you know, at a at, at, at drop of a hat. I'm 60, so... You know, at 60, usually guys' testosterone levels go down and the estrogen levels just go up. So I started taking Dempro, which is a natural thing that you can take to help flush out the extra estrogen and stuff. Didn't do a thing. <laughs> and, and Mary will tell you, I'll still, I'll just start thinking about something. I'll start crying. Yeah. Well, you had, not only did you have that as a child, but then you got married. Yeah. And, but right before you went in, in the, the military. military. And then you ended up getting stationed in Germany and couldn't you couldn't take, them, take them, with them with you. Couldn't take them with me no matter how bad I wanted to. And uh, when I came back, uh, she said she had had an affair and uh, wanted to divorce. And then after the divorce, she wouldn't let me see the kids. And no matter how hard I tried, and I, I went to an attorney and said, listen, you can spend every dime you can't have, but uh, there's not really much the state of Missouri can do about it, even though it says... Because I was in the military, they just said reasonable visitation rights, and you just got to set up a time because they wouldn't know when I was going to be deployed mm -hmm. or whatever. And so that was never. And so. And then we found out later that anything we sent, cards or present, never, never were given got to them. Never got them. And so that was, that was a horrible thing to have to deal with. And I think that was another shutting down. Yeah. That. Uh, that like goes back there. I couldn't. I couldn't have been the dad that I wanted to be, and it really shut down my heart. And uh, I, I, I just go back and I look at all that and, and the example. I remember, you know, I've, I've been preaching since I was thirteen. Um, unless mom and dad had to drive me to a church to preach, they never went. They never went to anything. I was in show choir. Never went to any of those things. And I repeated the same thing with with the kids that you had to drag me to them because. I was just just shut down and said, well, you know, they didn't go for me. I you know, and it's 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 repeating a pattern. It's that, repeating a pattern yeah. that needs to be broke. Well, and you had to, you know, we once we learned about, um, you know, inner vows that you make and and things like that. You went through lots and lots of prayer oh, yeah, and just choosing to forgive because we had to. I, I mean, uh, I swore back then, I'm never going to be like this, and and then, I was until, I became the same turd, you know, that God had to heal. <laughs> Until your mom went in the nursing home where she yeah. got so bad she couldn't, she couldn't function. Um, I mean, there that was a constant care that that you had to do. And I took far better care of her than she ever took care of me as a kid. And the and the Bible says we need to. Yeah. You know, we were, but it was it was difficult. It it was difficult. 
to this day, some days I, I, I still have a hard time go visiting her in the nursing home. Now, because uh, she had know who I am, and she talks about me in, in such grandiose ways of, you know, we were so close, and we she just can't imagine what happened, and and I'm thinking, when were we close? You know, it, it was it's the figment of your own imagination. I think that I think your mom must have had a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, and so. That's that's what happens, you know. In that generation, I think that generation, particularly, has struggled with things. And um, it was it was so odd though, because you know that's what God has done with this ministry is show us how to get healed and how to get restored. And it was there was some block there we never could get through. Yeah, we never could pray through. I remember because you know I I would always pray when it came to sermons and stuff. And God would always talk to me in sermons. And so uh, to a certain degree, it was like I would only talk to him when I had chores to do, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I remember that we, we had the little office over across from uh, the uh, Birmingham Martin Funeral Home. Mm-hmm. And I was just sitting in there and and almost kind of feeling used in the kingdom kind of thing, you know. And... All of a sudden, the presence of God came sweeping into that into that room, into my office. And I'm sitting there, and I begin weeping. And I could literally feel the hands of God being placed on my shoulders. And I, I had all the... Uh, back then, I had um, literally degrees and certificates and awards that filled all four walls. And I was sitting there feeling stupid. And I was having the the words of my of my uh, stepdad echo through my mind that I was stupid, that I would never amount to anything, and just over and over again. And it was right as I was beginning to kind of learn a little bit of our Hebraic heritage. And God showed up in that room. He laid hands on me. He said, "Listen, let me be your dad. Mm-hmm. Let me speak over you what I say." That's it. That's what you needed. And for the next 30 minutes, he began to speak over me as I began to weep and cry. And he began to nullify the words that my stepfather had repeated a million times over me. Mm -hmm. And began to break the curse of those words. Guys, that's why, you know, Hebraically, we need to speak blessings over our children. We need to speak that which we want to bring forth. That's it. Not that which the flesh gets mad at and you want to say, you never do anything right. No, you're an obedient child. You're a gifted child. You're going to be obedient to God. You're a, you're, you can do more than this. I know you can. And, and to be an encouragement because those words hold on to the mind. Boy, they do. Those things that you're, you're told when you're a child, those are the things you remember. I mean, every horrible comment made, everything that even a kid at school says to you, you remember those things. And and the only way to overcome them, in my opinion, is God has to show you the way out of it. You remember when that woman, uh, it was a prophetess, came through that one church we were attending, and and she said that, that, do you know you're called of God? And, of course, she said yes. And she said, you know that you're supposed to change the world. And you just stood there, and then she said, is, is that your wife? said, well, and she's going to pray you through. And I remember thinking, lady, if you just knew us and what a mess we were in, yeah. you would, she would have been terrified to said that, you know, because it just it looked so impossible. <clears throat> and I, I could tell anybody this, that no matter what state we were in, you always had the anointing to teach the Word, always. It was there. It flows. That's why, you know, people can be in really bad shape, but the gifts flow. Yeah. They just flow. That's why, like, sometimes you can hear um, a secular singer, and sometimes it's just you can tell it's good music. Other times there's an anointing on it, and, and they're not saved. Yeah. But the gift's there. <laughs> yeah. And and whether they'd ever use it for God or not, that's that's something that would have to be determined by salvation and things like that, But but it's there. Yeah. And it, it's almost like being two different people. I remember one time you told me, you said, listen, I fell in love with a guy in the pulpit. It's just this dude that I got to go home <laughs> with afterward. Because it was, it was like when the anointing came on me, it suppressed all the wounds. It did. 
and, it and all, all the shutdowns. But when the anointing lifted, then I was right back where I was. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where I began developing the concept that we, there's a personal anointing and there's a ministry anointing. And the, the trick, because a lot of ministers that don't work on that, uh, I mean, God will use them powerfully, let's say, on Sunday, and then God moves mightily. Uh, they'll go through depression Monday and Tuesday because they never develop the personal anointing that goes when you're not moving under the that's, other. That's and right. and the, the, the trick is to get your personal anointing to the same level as your ministry anointing so that you don't have this waterfall that you fall off of or a cliff that you fall off of after you get done ministry. Well, it's always hard for you at home. And I think it's because you were you were in Bob Lake's home. You know, I, I did the same thing. I was in my dad's home even after we had our own home. And and you have to it you was, have to it really was still work. stuck in my head. Yeah. You, you really have to work at it. And and it you'll find yourself doing the same things that you hated as a kid. You know, you just, it's its an odd thing how it all works. But the good news is, it's what God can do with the heart. And, you know, you, you know that um, our hearts can be divided because it, it says several times in the Word about praise the Lord with your whole heart. So so there, there obviously has to be... Well, there's a cry in the psalm, give me an undivided heart. Right. And so, so the good news is, though, is... God can heal. Our God is a, a God that restores. That's right. And, you know, it, you know, people look and say, well, you know, Mike and Mary, they're just so <laughs> anointed and they're so good. Let me, let me tell you something. We were an absolute mess. And, and biggest I, I message people, you've ever seen. <laughs> biggest message you've ever seen, okay? Uh, years ago, our uh, I used to say that our marriage sucked like a Hoover, but a Hoover doesn't have that much vacuum. It had to be like a Dyson or a Kirby, okay? Uh, and and God turned it around that uh, except when I was in the pulpit I was a mess and, and well in, in my some of my core being is has always been is that don't be a hypocrite yeah that was one of the reasons that I wasn't proud of my sin but I didn't hide it everybody just knew what I was doing because I thought I'm not gonna you know act like I'm prim and proper and and I've got this sinful life. Um, but it, it bothered me because I thought we couldn't be what we were supposed to be. Yeah. And I felt like we were big fakes and just, it just drove me nuts. And it, and it was a constant conflict on top of all the other junk. You know, we, uh, after the witch crawl in the van, all the occult people came, your ex-wife called and wanted your daughter to come and stay with us. I guess she'd essentially kick her out. out of the house. And so she came and stayed with us and found out she'd been in witchcraft and, and different occult things. So that got brought into the house. It totally affected our youngest daughter. Yep. Had begin have demonic uh, activity begin uh, manifesting in the house. All kinds of stuff. And we hadn't had that before. I mean, like... Well, well, I she had, sent a demon after one of the kids, and, and we prayed, and the demon came back after her. And the next thing, she's running down dust for protection. Yeah. She, she, I think she came to cause part of it, to cause division between our two kids. Yeah. And, um, and so she sent something after... Something came after Stephanie. Stephanie ran into the bedroom and said, Mom, I can't breathe she's just having a horrible time and so i uh i commanded it to leave i started praying over and lisa was right above us in the bedroom here she comes running down the stairs she said mom something just with a a shadow just walked through my room and then here came mike's other daughter down and it had come to attack her yeah because she's the one that sent it and And, she got got whooped up on so but but i mean these these are the kind of things we had to deal with and then later it's a circus when our youngest daughter decided she was going to be uh in a lesbian lifestyle even mike's ex-wife and his two children by that marriage were very much in promotion of that yeah and so not only are you dealing with all the occult stuff going on but you're dealing with all that stuff and we had we were losing animals, and Mike was the one that usually had to you know take care of, of that. He had to bury some, and and some were they were taken and called, and they called us and said what they'd done. And I won't go into that, but I mean this is this is heart shutting down material, 
it, it it's like like your heart's broken and somebody's standing on top of it and squishing it, <laughs> yeah. you know. And so, um, I I didn't have as much trouble with the shutdown as Mike did, because he he just had shut down years ago and it was just staying shut down. I was dissociative, and so I would just take things and set them over to the side and leave them over there and not deal with them. Because I, I had, you know, you have to function. You yeah. have to keep going. You have to keep praying and protect your kids. And um, it it was the it was a highly um, refiner's fire, it was, a and, high and, level refiner's and fire. And because of all that I went through and all the anger that I had, I always knew that I had a um, very violent anger that laid way back there. And I, I sat on it like a sumo wrestler. Okay. I would never let it up. And so a lot of times when I should have reacted, I didn't react because I was afraid that I was going to let that thing loose. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in the process of all that, that, I mean, that's taken care of. That's no longer there so that I can react without overreacting. Yeah. That's hard to do. You know, it's like if, you know, somebody, uh, you know, says something in the, in Walmart or pushes you or something. Next thing you know, you're beating the holy snot out of them. I didn't, I never wanted anything like that to ever happen. And so I just sat on it. And a lot of times I took things that I shouldn't have taken, even, even at church, because I was, I was afraid that if I ever let that go, I couldn't control it. Well, I knew that I had the propensity because I was, I was vacillating back and forth over the people in the occult. You know, when, when the, Spirit of the Lord was moving through me, and there was anointing there. I would be praying for them. Oh, they, save them, save them, They'd get save saved. Them. The wipe next, them out, Lord. The next wipe minute, them. I'd be sitting there saying, you come near my kids, I'm going <laughs> to take your heads off, you know. It was it was so unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, a, they could make a movie. It's almost like that one movie. Uh, I prayed, Lord said, put bury him in the back 40. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable. It would be hard to describe it all. It would be hard to describe all of the heartbreak um, you know, I even had, I'll just bear my soul here. I had a lot of resentment with Mike's mom because we had to take care of her. I didn't get to take care of my mom. Yeah. Especially and, when she treated you like poo our, our entire marriage. Well, but, but it, I didn't get to take care of my mom and my mom deserved it. Yeah. My mom deserved to be taken care of. And they went with my sister and it was better that way because they couldn't have handled what we were, what we were going through anyway. But they they deserved yeah. to be taken care of. And I I had always told you I liked your mom better than I liked mine. And I remember when uh, mom and dad bought their house there, where they could literally see your mom and dad's backyard right from their house. And your mom was always inviting us over for dinner. I mean, that's how she showed people she loved him as she cooking loved him. for him. And let me tell you something: she could make that butter flavored Crisco <laughs> do wonders for Not- fried chicken. <laughs> Not good for your your health, but she knew sure. how to make things. Taste. It was good, and, <laughs> and uh, the only time my mom ever invited us over to eat is when we could bring food. When when uh, Bob's kids would come down, and she wanted us to help to be a buffer. That's that's the only time. And uh, I remember she was grappling, saying, "How come you're over there all the time?" I said, "Because she invited us, and she actually cooked us food." And uh, I loved your mom a lot. I really yeah, I did. know you did. And uh, it's it's interesting, you know. All of us have a backstory. Every single one of us have a backstory. And the good news is, the depth of God's love, the power of the blood of Jesus, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is always deeper and greater than anything that we have ever experienced and that we have gone through. And it doesn't matter how messed up we are because the truth is all of us are messed up. Every single, ever, ever since Adam and Eve, every family's been messed up. Everything's, uh, all of us have gone through things. I remember there was a, uh, she was kind of a comedian, but she was, she was talking about her own stuff and, and, and how God brought her through. And her, her book was about how God uses cracked pots because all of us are cracked, broken vessels that the master potter restores. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, and he, you know, the scriptures say about how God is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Psalm 147 says, He healeth the broken heart and bindeth up their wounds. And so he's so good to us. (coughs) 
<laughs> Excuse me. If you ever wanted to see the heart of God, you could see it in this whole situation we were in because it was the biggest mess you ever saw. It, it would have looked impossible that anybody could have come through that with a, a sane mind. <laughs> and not only did we come through it and are sane, but he healed us. Yeah. He restored us out of, and and the more we found out, the more insane it looked. Yeah. But he he did it. I need to see if I can dig out the old the audio message I have of the Potter's Field. You know the the price that Jesus paid for us. Sometimes, unless you really study, you don't know the full depths. When Judas betrayed him. Okay, now it, it wasn't somebody on the peripheral. It was one of the twelve that Judas was so trusted that he was the treasurer and he betrayed him. Well, when you go on to read the story, the Bible talks about how Judas hung himself and that, that wasn't by rope. That That's just basic an old English way of saying he hung himself on a sword. Okay. That the betrayal money, that uh, they couldn't put it back into the treasury, so they bought the potter's field. Now, the Bible is very specific about the potter's field, and we read over that, and we think, oh, I don't know what that means. The betrayal money bought the field where all the broken vessels were discarded. So that could be redeemed. You and I were in that potter's field. And that blood money bought us back. That's right. And the blood of Jesus restores us. And the potter, the creator of the universe, puts us back on his wheel, on that potter's wheel. Yeah, that's it. And remolds us. Boy, we had to be his image. Man. And the word says, guys, I don't care how marred we are, how messed up, how cracked we are. The Apostle Paul said, We are predestined. To be conformed yeah, to into the image of Jesus. That's right. Well, and it's I I guess our testimony is can help people because if if God can take us through this and and straighten the you know it says that He straightens out the crooked places, <laughs> we would have looked like some jagged thing like. Going down, you couldn't even imagine. Because Picasso would have looked at that and said, yeah, that really looks weird. We would have looked abstract, that's for sure. But he, he's, his love for us, you know, we, we can testify of the heart of the Father. Yeah. It's full of compassion and mercy. And there's no situation he can't fix. I tell you what, if he can put up with me, he can put up with anybody. <laughs> if, if he can fix me, he can fix anybody. Well, you know, and... You had to forgive your mom for the yeah. shortcoming she had, um, but she she wouldn't have had I don't think um, spiritual strength to fight what was going on because whatever was going on that was initially there to take your life was was just pressing on you the whole time. That's why she married that man. Satan was just throwing one thing in there, you know, constantly trying to get you in the Freemasons having. You know, you stayed with the aunt that was married to a Freemason. They were constantly pushing you to that. She was going to Eastern Star events. So there was everything that Satan could push in there to make it impossible for you to do what you're doing right now. He did. Yeah. He just he crammed it in there. And and look at that. It God saw it all and he said, Watch this. Yeah. And we're now seeing, I mean, Every time I get an email from someone that says how God touched their life or how God sets them free. Um, blows your mind. Blows my mind. I'm humbled. Uh, yeah, because and you, you so just. God, just thank you for your grace. And it shows you that God can use anybody, guys. I'm telling you, I, I stay at awe when we get testimonies that God's used the ministry, used something that, you know, we've said, because he's has to just do it. If you do, if you do. What bad shape we were. He had to restore us to the place he could flow something through us. And that's that's the number one thing with me. I was so shattered. If if he'd have tried to flow something through me, it'd have went 
a hundred different directions. I don't even know. And never gonna, reach where it was supposed know, to go. Yeah. It's like tributaries or something yeah. in a. I was, I was, uh, I guess it was about a couple of years ago. I was reading through the Christmas magazine and they had this little article that says, you know, what Bible character are you? <laughs> First thing went through my mind. I'm Balaam's donkey. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's just it's been it's been something to watch what God's done in our life. The good news is that we are a testimony of God's ability to take a shattered vessel, yeah, and do His will with. Yeah, and you know the one of the things that we have to do because in Proverbs it says twenty three nineteen in Proverbs it says, "Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guard thine heart, guard thine heart in the way." And then in Proverbs 4, 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Um, you have to guard your heart. Yes, you do. You know, that's one of the things that Satan's after. He's he's trying to break your heart. And break and I'm heart, sure everybody listening has had a broken heart at some time or another. Yep. You know, he's just out to break our hearts because he he knows that if our heart's broken, if if there's hindrances to the flow of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be at full capacity to do what God wants us to do. So he's constantly trying to bring things your way to break your heart. Oh, and so so that's why, um, you know, we got to start teaching these young people when when they're young, guard your heart. Guard your heart, and we need to be honest with them about our past. You know, one of the things that I've seen with so many ministries is everything is public relation. Everything has to be squeaky clean. Everything has, it's, it's like you put on this facade because – that's what we're supposed to do in ministry. I think we're supposed to be real and and say, listen, don't make the mistakes I made. Yeah. Because you can you can set something in motion that may take you years to overcome. Yeah. That's what we tell our grandsons all the time. We're teaching them while they're young. You know, you can make a decision and and it affects your whole life and gotta guard your heart. Yeah. Gotta make those wise decisions and, and God helps us. You know, back Back when we first got married, what the vein of uh, churches that we were in were um, faith churches. Now, I I went when I was in high school at an Assembly of God church. Um, But then we got into the the faith, and and it just looked like it it was another thing because of part of their teachings. Now, they have some teachings that are right. There are some good teachings. But the the thing about, you know, it's all a matter of faith, and if you've got enough faith, you can do this, and you're going to just increase in money, and and you give money, and it's going to come back to you. And and nobody that we knew did it work for. (laughs) You know, it's almost like, and maybe that's part of the problem, is it's teaching you to uh, look at it in a wrong way. Yeah. You know, oh, your needs are going to be met. You're going to have all this money, and and you need to be looking at anything you give to God as a worship to Him. And I don't know that that was ever, as a ever. worship instead of a lotto. Um, and they never they never mentioned hard work, or or honing and developing the gifts that God was within mm-hmm. you. It was just throw money at it. And there were some good preachers in there. I don't want yeah. to. We learned learned a lot of truth. Yeah. But that but that was kind of making it worse because it made a, our defects look like that's the reason it didn't work. Yeah. And so we had to come through all that. It's such you know, back a mess. Then we didn't. Uh, well, I'll look at the journey and the grace of God. One of the neatest things I think God ever did, and I, I still to this day want to ask John Gar why he did that when he brought me to that first Hebraic colloquium. Okay, I didn't know Hebraic from you know from anything, but he said I'm going to bring you in as an educational consultant, and him and John Looper and Carl Koch and. Uh, Dwight Pryor and so many others just loved on me. And I remember I almost had to get in their suitcase to bring back all the tapes and stuff they gave me. And when I really wanted to sound profound, I'd pull something out from Dwight Pryor. Now, this is what the <laughs> Hebrew means, you know. But uh, God was setting me up because he knew what was coming. And then after we were under attack, we found out they were desecrating the fall feast. Mm-hmm. All of those resources were sitting there. Plus, I had already made uh, relationships with all these people like Dr. Marv Wilson out of Gordon College and different ones, that I could pick up the phone. Mm-hmm. And um, returning to God's ways and God's commandments is what made us, if you will, bulletproof for the occult. And that's when they got livid because we took away their secret weapons of using Christmas and Easter and all these different other things against the body of Christ. that we And eating pork. And, and eating pork. and You could tell when we would hit on something because it would tick them off. Yeah. <laughs> and you know we were dealing with 
program multiples, so the back parts, the parts that had been trained in the occult would come up, and, and they couldn't hide their reaction. It was just there. and So you thought, hmm, not that you take that as, you know, the Bible, of course, is, is what we look at for the answer, but they sure were making it obvious. They were. And then when we begin keeping the commandments, it begin closing all the doors to where the enemy was constantly stealing our money. Yeah. And, and we got to a place where God could bless us. And in uh, in the most impossible situation to yes. me, and because I really was, I back then I was looking at, well, we may end up living in a tent, <laughs> you know, because who who's going to well, support you, a ministry that that says this stuff, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's gonna, but I I didn't care. I was going to do what God said, and I was so grateful for His protection over us, uh, His His compassion over us. You know, I was I was kind of. My dad was an angry man, and I it was from things that happened to him when he was a kid. I understand, but it's hard to live in a house like that because you just you you just try to stay out of their way, and you just kind of duck your head. You never know when they're going to blow up. And um, I remember I had I was waiting for God to do that with me. I you know I knew I'd mess up or something, and I and I go and I just kind of you know tense up and think, okay, I'm ready. You let me have it. He never did. Never. No. Never came harshly. Even, even when I, um, probably the, the uh, only time he was bold with me, I think, um, was when we were we were talking about something, and I said, "Well, because um, back then I I wasn't watching my words, so I was I was reinforcing what the devil had done." And I said, "Well, I'll tell you one thing: uh, it's a miracle if God can use uh, me and Mike. You know, it's." You know, he he must have been desperate to choose us. I said something like that. And I knew the minute I said it, I thought, oh, man, I just said something wrong. And so I, that night I went to pray, and uh, I said, God, I, I messed up, and I, please forgive me. And, and he said, never call me desperate. Yeah. And then he been about 20 minutes declaring who he was to me and that he was great enough to pull me and you out of anything and he and he just loved on me yeah he's done that to me many times i remember one time i did something really stupid and okay okay i'm gonna go pray i'm, I'm ready to get my two-hour lecture that i had been conditioned that i was gonna get and i go to prayer and he said he said, well, what'd you do? And I said, something stupid. He said, okay, you recognized it was stupid, right? Oh, Father, it was really, really stupid. And he said, why did you do something stupid? I said, because I acted the way that I was trained as a kid instead of the way you've been teaching me. And he said, so what was the lesson that you learned? Well, Father, don't get stuck on stupid and, and do the word instead of what my conditioning has taught me, and I need to break that conditioning and begin training my flesh. Because he, he took me to Hebrews where it said, even by reason of use, our flesh can be trained to discern good and evil. In other words, the, 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 our, our flesh can be trained to do righteousness to where that is your initial reaction, not, not something that you have to pause and think and say, okay, my flesh wants to do, eh, but God wants me to do this. And he says, how about start training your flesh now before you get there and start seeing yourself now? Uh, God did that with me when, uh, when he first called me into ministry. If I had to get up in front of people, and I could be the class clown, okay? Never stuttered being the class clown. But I would take an F on a report rather than have to give up and give it because I would stutter. And then God calls me to preach. I ran, Mary. I sang in the choir. I mowed the churchyard. I did anything. You know, you need toilets clean. Just, just tell me. It is anything except getting up in the pulpit. And uh, after I surrendered to preach, God said, uh, you need to see yourself differently. Mm -hmm. And I would literally, he began showing me doing what I'm doing now. I'm going and preaching to hundreds and sometimes thousands of people. And it, it became so real in me that, Sometimes I am more comfortable in the pulpit than I am uh, sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. 
it became so real. And God's doing the same thing now. You know, I'm going up and I'm, I'm walking in the center and stuff. And God says, start seeing this place full of hungry people that are hungry for God, that love God, that are real remnant, that are on fire for God. Start seeing it. Start seeing it. Mm -hmm. Start seeing my power move through you and to begin to heal people. You know, I, in the past, I've prayed for people and I've seen them healed. Right. And, a lot of and, times. And, and, and that has, in, in a sense, has kind of died down. God says, you need to rekindle that. You yeah, need to, I think. You need to start seeing that. I think that that's something, too, that we've had to work through, guys, is we... We had so many people sent in to discourage us. Um, I I had so much stuff said to me about the way I looked. I still, to this day, am working through getting in front of people. Um, just because I, f I feel like I'm, you know, just up there to be ridiculed. That's just, that's how I feel. And, I mean, I'm working on it. And uh, I've had so many wonderful people that have contacted us and been so gracious to me. It's it's helping heal me. But, man, there was, were so many things said about how I looked, about um, it was it was just, I think it was to just deepen those wounds that were already there. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I told you before I felt like I was a freak because I was overweight. And and because of, of that town I was raised in, and they were they were trying to groom people, they, they tried to pressure you into being what they wanted you to be. A Barbie doll. And yeah. and so, man, it was it was rough. Well, little did she know I liked curves. So. Yeah, and that was kind of handy. <laughs> 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 but, I mean, there's so many things. But but this this is what I wanted to, to say after all this stuff we've talked about. Don't ever doubt that it's God's will to heal you. No. To restore your broken heart and that he is well able to do it. I don't care what you've been through. And I know there are people that have been through a lot worse than we have. But he is able, and he's wanting to heal you. You know, the remnant have really been attacked. Now, you find somebody that's remnant, and they've got a story to tell because Satan's went to work. I don't know how he Hell knew they were back. remnant, but he did. And he's, he's went to work on them to, to break them down, to discourage them. To, to make, I, I think Satan has done so much stuff that he literally thought we'd all just be laying on the floor and couldn't even raise up out of the mess that we were in to do anything. But our God is so much greater. So much greater. And he can raise us up out of the miry clay. He can lift us up out of depression. He can break off bondages. He can restore where you think it looks like it can't be restored. And... If we just keep doing his word, guys, and we won't give up, he's going to do a mighty thing through his people. Yes, he is. It, it looks like right now just everything's falling to pieces, and my goodness, there's not going to be enough food and, and all this stuff. But watch what our God's getting ready to do. Yes. You watch what he's getting ready he's to do. He's going to confound the enemy That's for right. the sake of his remnant and for the sake of his great name. And you know, to like you said that you would envision yourself preaching and things like that when we walk over at the— um, at the conference center, I'm just seeing that place filled with people and God moving mightily to heal, restore. I'm just getting that getting that vision in my heart so that it I, the anointing can flow. Yeah. And, and want, we're going to pray it in there. <laughs> I want the anointing in the preaching, the anointing in the ministry time, the anointing in the music. And let me tell you something, there's going to be anointing in the food too. Ooh, we're going to pray over that. We're going to... Because my, my, my wife has the gift of hospitality. Well, God is able to... To give us healthy food and make it make it taste good, <laughs> I'm probably I'm probably going to be following recipes. Usually, I'm one of those cooks that I just throw stuff in, but I'll follow recipes on this. I don't want to mess up. Well, the, the number one ingredient's love, baby. Yes, that's that true. There'll be there. lots of love in there because I I love. love the people that are coming. I I really do. God's given us such a heart. You know, there's so many many times we just sit and we'll be even talking to Steffi on the phone about something we've heard. And we're all just crying. Um, he's given us a heart. To help people. Yeah. And and he's given us the background of seeing him do it in our lives so we can believe it for others. You know, because we're, in my in my opinion, we were some of the hardest cases. <laughs> and I still, to this day, I, I've had to fight a lot of discouragement, I think, just coming from the enemy for the last couple of years. He doesn't want the conference center. And it's going along fine, and God's just providing everything. But every once in a while, I'll just, I'll just have this discouragement coming over me, like, we can't do this. This is something like a big preacher is going to do. We can't. But, you know, God can take anybody that's, that's 
a yielded vessel. And that's what I concentrate on. God's been dealing with me about being willing and obedient. Just be willing and yeah, obedient. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the key, I think. And he'll do the rest. We just yeah. got to be obedient, follow what he's saying. And, um, and, I, and I think that's why a lot of things have come up. Me and Mike have cried more in the last couple of years and probably all our lives. We just uh, are touched easily when we hear of someone suffering. Yeah. Uh, touched easily, uh, touched easily with, uh, I've, I've lost count of the things I, and sometimes I'll, I'll see a flower and I'll start crying. It's just, (laughs) well, it's, there's a lot of things that if, if you grow up in bondage, you don't even appreciate. I remember when I came out of that depression, I don't think I'd ever seen the colors like they were like, it just looked like everything was so beautiful. And so I never experienced that. I guess just the heaviness was so much that it just skewed my appreciation of God's nature. But now we just can take, especially like the, when the deer come on our property and things like that, it's just just a gift from God. And, and that's one of the things that I believe God's getting ready to do. He is going to lift the heaviness. Yeah. He's going to lift it off of his people. His people are going to have strength where you didn't think that there could be strength. You know, as you as you get older, uh, the world just kind of puts in your head, you're going to be on all these meds, you're just going to be weak, you can't do anything. Well, I don't believe that. I Not believe that God can bring restoration, and uh, we've seen it. You, yeah. you know, we still got a ways to go, but we've seen a lot of restoration in our lives. We have one of the things that we pray every day, not only of ourselves, but all of our partners that are 50 or older, for God to renew their strength, for God to renew their youth. Because all of us, we still have a destiny that we've got to do in God. Yeah, that's it. And uh, God has, has brought us into the kingdom for such a time as this. And we're going to see supernatural restoration. And we're going to see things with our eyes of the power of God moving that we've only dreamed about our entire Boy, that's life. that's it. That's it. We're going to see it. We're going we're to see, see restorations that, that looked impossible. You know, like it because I think what God's doing, it, and isn't this like God, you know, in the 50s, 60s, Satan started this whole big, big agenda. 60s, the rock and roll, love, sex, all that stuff, to take us so far away from God. Even if you're in church, t- take everything so far away from God that there was no place for, for him to to come. You know, he's not going to come in the middle of a bunch of, of junk. No. <laughs> and so he he tried all this this time to get the body of Christ in such a mess that we couldn't even function. Yeah, there's going to there's gonna be a new Jesus movement because when you look at back what he did in the 60s, he pushed all these hippies and everything so far from God, he pushed them into God. And uh, I, I just finished reading a thesis by one of our one of our students. She did such a wonderful job, uh, Susan did. And she talked about that Jesus culture because they were drug addicts and all these other things. When they got saved, their dedication to God was unparalleled because they were grateful mm-hmm. at what God had done. Well, I mean, all that stuff they were doing takes you down to the depths. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm sure that they they had similar experience to me where you just, you're low and they probably were hooked on drugs and and you know how that, that cycle goes. And so there were there had to be miraculous deliverance. And so their their hearts were grateful. Their hearts... And now that We're gratefulness, they were so dedicated to uh-huh. God, and, and God honored it by bringing uh, great healings mm-hmm. and, and great deliverance and so many salvations. Guys, I think we're on the, we're on the cusp yeah. of seeing that again. Mm-hmm. He's going to raise us up. He's going to raise us up, and, and he's the only one that can. You know, he's, I want, he's the only one. Before Jesus comes back, I want the lamb to receive the reward of his suffering. And what is that? That's lost souls coming into the kingdom. Jesus deserves one more great harvest before he comes back. One more great harvest. And guys, there are more people alive right now on planet Earth than have existed since from Adam to probably 1950. There's more people alive right now. The greatest harvest that the kingdom could ever see is right now. And, Father, right now, we're the, every remnant member. Father, I just pray that you would loose a healing anointing. Father, go where the pain is and to relieve it. 
Father, go where the wounds are and to restore, and where the brokenness is, let that which is broken be healed and restored right now in the name of Jesus. Yes, Father. Father, heal our hearts. Soften our hearts towards you so that your kingdom can flow through us. Father, I ask for this, that you would just set all of us onto a program for supernatural restoration, supernatural healing of ourselves, spirit, soul, and body, that we could be an army ready to pray in the kingdom in any situation, to share the hope that is within us in every situation, to be willing to fight for the souls of men, to draw them out of the clutches of Mystery Babylon. Father, you know where the pain is. You know where the hurt is. And Father, I ask that you would touch each one of us right now in those places and bring healing and restoration for the sake of your great name and by the power of the blood of Jesus that you would restore. Yes. Restore, restore Father. God. Restore, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Hi, friends. Pastor Mike Spalding here to announce the Go Therefore 2022 conference. We are all witnesses to what has happened to America. Wickedness has overwhelmed our land. It is time for the body of Jesus Christ to come together and raise up the banner of our King. Now is the time for the Ecclesia to make our voice heard. We must bind the strong man in order to reclaim our land. Joining us this year to bring this much-needed clarion call are the following speakers. Dr. Sherry Tenpenny. James Spence, founder of Operation Heal America. Dr. John Diamond, host of America Unhinged on Brideon TV. Kenny C., host of The Rock with Kenny C. Derek and Sharon Gilbert, authors and hosts of award-winning programs on Skywatch TV and the PTL Network. Dr. Michael Lake, author of award-winning books, founder of Biblical Life College and Seminary, and host of Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. David Hevner, author, accomplished filmmaker and producer, director of The Last Evangelist TV series. Carl Gallops, senior pastor of Hickory Hammock Baptist Church and a top 60 Amazon best-selling author. Casper McLeod, pastor of Upper Room Fellowship, author, songwriter, guitarist, and portrait artist. Randy Conway, David Paxton, and Rick Hidalgo from the C2K Report. They'll provide a timely teaching on the steps you must take to protect yourself and your family from Babylon. Coach Dave Daubenmeyer from Pass the Salt Ministries. Neil Peterson, pastor of Harvest Revival Center and current candidate for governor of Ohio. Tom Dunn through the Black Ministries. And of course, myself, Dr. Mike Spaulding. Registration is now open at the conference website, gothereforeconference.com. GoThereforeConference.com Registration is still only $59. A recommended hotel is the Best Western Dayton Northwest in Englewood. The hotel is a short 20 minutes from the Dayton International Airport and the conference venue. Mention Go Therefore Conference for the special rate of $89. Book your rooms now as they will sell out. Go Therefore 2022 Conference Reclaiming the Land, Binding the Strongman. I'll see you there. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.